This content is brought to you by iTrust Capital, which is a great platform that allows you to easily invest in crypto without worrying about taxes or fees. iTrust Capital allows you to invest in crypto through an individual retirement account or IRA. IRAs are tax-sheltered accounts, which means all of your crypto is tax-free and can even grow tax-free over time. The process of signing up with iTrust Capital is very easy. They have a mobile app. They have 25 plus cryptocurrencies. They have full support, a dedicated team ready to help you. And it is free. And once again, 100% free to sign up with iTrust Capital. There are no hidden fees and there's no monthly subscription or membership. They also have great security. They utilize Coinbase custody for all their custodial services. So you don't have to worry. It is institutional grade crypto custody that they are using. This is a great platform. Uh, once again, it is free to sign up. So visit the link in the description and go check it out. If you sign up with my link, you get a $100 funding bonus. So once again, check the link in the description. Welcome back to the Thinking Crypto Podcast, your home for cryptocurrency news and interviews. With me today is a very special guest, Rick Edelman, who's a legendary Wall Street advisor founder of the Edelman Financial Services and the Digital Assets Council of Financial Professionals, and as well as the author of 10, over 10 personal finances uh, books, uh, including a new book, which we're going to talk about today. Rick, uh, it's an honor to have you on the show again. I appreciate it. Thanks so much. Good to be with you. Well, Rick, uh, the, since the last time we spoke in December 2020, how things have changed. Um, crypto has seen a, a huge adoption and price increase. Obviously, right now, market cycle is playing out, but uh, nevertheless, the building and the adoption continues. And you've written a new book, which was released this week, The Truth About Crypto. Tell us about this book and why you decided to write it. Yeah, Tony, I appreciate that. Uh, the Truth About Crypto is my 11th book, as you noted. Uh, I didn't plan on writing any more books, but then crypto came out. Totally new, totally different, really demanded a, a book on its own because so many people are curious about this new technology, this new investment opportunity. You know, what is blockchain? What is Bitcoin? How does it work? Why should I care? Should I invest? And if so, how and how much? So that's what the truth about crypto is all about. It debuted this week, as you said, it immediately went to number one uh, bestseller on uh, one of Amazon's bestseller lists. And uh, it's getting lots of great reviews, all five star. And so I'm really excited that the book has been so well received right from the get go. Uh, the, the reason is real simple. We all want to understand this new incredible technology. There really aren't many places you can get objective, independent advice that's uh, and, and content information that's in your best interest without bias, without a product pitch. And that's what the truth about crypto does for you. And, you know, you've been educating folks about investing in personal finance for so long. Uh, you just bring a plethora of experience and, and knowledge. And uh, I know you've decided to take, well, I shouldn't say uh, you've decided, you already have taken the big plunge into crypto and you've been working with registered investment advisors and, and the folks on your end to help uh, educate and you know, bring crypto to the masses. Um, is your book written for the average show or is it for folks in the crypto industry or is it a bit of both? It's written for consumers predominantly and also investment advisors. Uh, it is the consumer, the, the average everyday American, the investors who are trying to get their arms around this. They, we're being bombarded everywhere every day with messages about Bitcoin. You know, they're dominant advertisers now. They were mean at the, the, the Super Bowl and the World Series. Crypto companies are slapping their, their brands on uh, sports stadiums. They've hired Hollywood actors and professional athletes to tout their products. And so consumers keep hearing about this. They keep hearing about the incredible price appreciation that, have, that has occurred. I mean, Bitcoin's the best performing asset class in history, up 40 million percent in the last 12 years. The best one, three, five, and 10-year track records beating by far, easily, all stocks, bonds, government securities, real estate, gold, commodities, you name it. And yet everybody's very curious because we keep hearing about scams. We hear about hacks. We hear about people losing money because they've lost their password. They can't get access to their crypto. Uh, and there's just a lot of controversy over this. 
Uh, we hear about NFTs with somebody selling a piece of digital art for $69 million and, and uh, just crazy stuff. And people are trying to get their arms around it. Is it a fad? Is it a fraud? Is it a tulip bulb or a beanie baby? Is this something I ought to be paying attention to? My kids keep talking about this with me. Mm -hmm. You know, what do, I, what do I do? And so what I've learned is that most of the financial industry is no more knowledgeable about this stuff than everyday investors. So when you go to your financial advisor and ask basic questions, what is Bitcoin? Most advisors can't answer the question either. And this leaves consumers really struggling with where to get the help. And so my book, The Truth About Crypto, is written for people who know nothing about it, but are curious about understanding what it is and helping them decide whether they should pay any attention and whether they should invest, and if so, how. I do have a couple of chapters in the book written for financial advisors, compliance, regulation, taxation, which advisors really care about. And I think that ordinary readers will like those chapters too, because it's like a peek behind the curtain. What does an advisor care about that I might not think of, uh, such as uh, anti-money laundering rules or other regulations that uh, advisors have to pay attention to? So I think everyone's going to really enjoy the book. We already have a lot of advisors buying the book in bulk quantity to give out to their clients. And so we're really excited about it the broad adoption the book is getting. Yeah, that's great that you're taking folks behind a curtain, as you said, uh, to understand how this all works from both angles, not just the consumer, but the, the folks who are um, uh, helping them navigate the technology. Now, uh, with the growth that we saw over the past uh, few years, significant growth, um, we see a push to make uh, crypto as another asset class that folks can diversify into. And some of the logistics are still being set up, you know, as far as entry points into retirement accounts. I think uh, uh, Fidelity just did something recently with a 401k. Um, do you think that, you know, anytime soon we'll start seeing more of that, if that trend is going to continue this year and, and that might be a big hurdle or barrier for, for a lot of folks? There, there is an explosion in the mainstreaming of crypto. Um, one out of five Americans owns digital assets right now. Uh, and there are an awful lot more who are interested. We have uh, half of all the nation's financial advisors personally own digital assets, and uh, about a quarter of them are actively recommending it to their clients. Uh, institutional investors, pension funds, endowments are, are all invest, investing in digital assets. Um, hedge funds and uh, venture capitalists, private equity, uh, major corporations are all investing. So it's getting very common. And the big news you just mentioned is Fidelity. Their big announcement uh, earlier this month that they're going to allow workers who have access to their 401k plans buy Bitcoin in the 401k. This is a big deal because Fidelity is not only one of the biggest asset managers in the world, they're a household name. Fidelity is the largest, the number one 401k provider in America. 23,000 companies use the Fidelity 401k for their workers. We're talking like 10 million workers across the country, $2.7 trillion wow. in Fidelity 401k plans. So for, for Fidelity to say, we're now going to allow you to buy Bitcoin in your 401k is huge news. It's exciting because quite frankly, the best place to buy Bitcoin is in a retirement account. Sure. You use dollar cost averaging because you're not investing a single lump sum. You don't have to worry about investing today in the market crashing tomorrow because you're investing slowly with every paycheck over the course of your career. You're doing it on a tax deferred basis with a tax deduction to boot. And most employers are matching contributions. You're literally getting free crypto. So it's a great idea. It's wonderful to see. And Fidelity, because of their size and their reputation, they're going to be pushing a lot of others into doing the same thing as them, other 401k providers. And for a lot of workers, let's face it, Tony, the only place they invest is their 401k because they can't afford to invest elsewhere. So if they don't have the opportunity to buy Bitcoin in their 401k, they'll never have the opportunity. So being able to do it in their retirement pl plan at work is wonderful news. And I really applaud Fidelity for their leadership in this area. Yeah, absolutely. And um, to your point of the statistics, we're seeing more and more folks are uh, 
you know, investing in the crypto asset class. And, and do you foresee that, you know, with a approval, and we don't know when this is going to happen, but of a Bitcoin spot ETF, that we'll see even further investments via retirement accounts and some of these uh, different financial products and services and so forth. Everybody's in agreement that their most favored approach for buying Bitcoin is through a Bitcoin ETF. ETFs are the most popular investment vehicle in America. They, they had uh, over a trillion dollars of contributions last year. Uh, investors love them because they're easy, they're cheap, they're affordable, they're transparent. You buy them in a brokerage account, often at no commission. Uh, your financial advisor probably recommends ETFs for you. It's a wonderful way to build a diversified portfolio. I've been a champion of ETFs for, for 20 plus years. But the SEC so far has not said yes to a Bitcoin ETF. We're rather frustrated by this because it's forcing those who want to buy Bitcoin to go to other ways of doing it, which are more cumbersome, more burdensome, less liquidity, more expensive. And it's not really doing the investing public any good at all. So we're hopeful that the SEC will say yes to a Bitcoin ETF uh, within the next uh, six months to a year. But we have to wait and see if they're uh, going to do that. In the meantime, our recommendation to investors is don't wait. I mean, investors have been waiting. I can't begin to tell you, Tony, how many people I've met who have said, when the ETF comes out, I will buy. Mm -hmm. My attitude is Bitcoin is already $40,000. How much longer are you going to wait? Uh, are you going to wait until it's 50 or 60 or 70,000? How much of the profit, how much of the gain and value are you going to keep missing because you're waiting for the convenient way to buy it? Buy it now, even if it's a little more of a hassle or more cumbersome, because it's better that you're engaged in early, while Bitcoin is what many people regard still to be low prices compared to where it's headed in the future. Yeah, absolutely. And, and there have been a lot of uh, analogies between the crypto asset class and uh, the internet and, and its growth in the 90s and the adoption curve and so forth. You know, do you personally have a point of view as to if we were to align the timeline, are we in 1996, 97, 98 of the internet? You know, we're still early. And to your point, take a position because we're, we're, still, we're so early. This is the early 90s uh, on a relative scale. Um, Bitcoin is 12 years old, uh, and it is only in the past couple of years that it has begun to gain institutional adoption. It's only in the past four months that the government has made it very clear that they are supportive of building out this technology. So it is very early. Uh, and it's really interesting because I find often people use Bitcoin's volatility as a reason not to want to invest. I mean, there have been seven occasions since uh, it was invented where Bitcoin has fallen 50% or more in value, including in the past six months. So people are fearful because of, of this. And they say, gee, you know, it, it might explode. It might go broke. It, it, it might get banned. It, it might whatever. And they, they want to wait until it matures. Well, that's fine to wait until it matures. But that's like saying, I don't want to buy Microsoft when it's new. I'm going to wait and buy Microsoft today. You're missing out on the whole point. And here's the fascinating thing. Although it's true that Bitcoin has been incredibly volatile in its history of 12 years, go pull up a chart of the price performance of the first 12 years of Microsoft, Apple, Amazon, or Google. You'll see the same exact price volatility. Any new emerging technology is incredibly uncertain, volatile, risky in the early days. But that is when the wealth gets built. Yeah, absolutely. And I, I just thought about the 2000 um, dot com bubble pop. And I remember Amazon falling about 80 something percent. Uh, and if you ran scared or you, you were like, wow, OK, I can't, you know, the volatility scares me. You missed out on a huge op buying opportunity there. And that's the whole point. This isn't a get rich quick scheme. 
This isn't a fad. This isn't something to hop in today to make a lot of money tomorrow. This is a long-term technology. I mean, look at the people who invested in, in Ford Motor Company in the 1920s. Hmm. Yeah. Was that a get-rich-quick opportunity? I don't think so. But look at it 100 years later, and this is one of the most powerful companies, profitable companies on the planet. So we need to recognize this is an innovative technology. It's in the early stages, and it's going to have a bumpy ride. But if you invest for the long term as part of a broadly diversified portfolio, it can make a lot of sense. Absolutely. Um, I wanted to ask you about the two groups uh, that you helped found, uh, and that was the Digital Assets Council of Financial Professionals and the Funding Our Future Coalition. Tell us about those and, and uh, the mission statement, essentially, and, and what you guys have been up to. Well, I'll start with FOF. Um, the Funding Our Future Coalition uh, reflects the fact that I've been involved in the retirement security movement throughout my entire career. Uh, we have a couple of huge problems in our country, financially speaking. The first is that we have a financially illiterate adult population. Mm. Most Americans don't know much about money. Most yeah. Americans can't explain how credit and debt works. They aren't able to uh, understand mortgages, buying a car, getting a will, whether they need insurance, let alone investing. And as a contribution to this issue, the fact that people don't know much about money, don't realize how much money they're going to need, the importance of savings, how best to go about saving, people are not saving enough for retirement. We have a $4 trillion retirement gap. The amount of money we're going to need in retirement versus the amount of money we've saved. Mm. Millions of Americans reach age 65 every year with insufficient money saved up. The average U.S. household has saved less than $100,000. Where are you going to get the money to support yourself in retirement? And it gets worse when we realize that we're living longer than ever, thanks to exponential technologies like AI, robotics, nanotech, biotech, bioinformatics, uh, 3D printing, neuroscience. We're going to be living into our 90s and 100s your retirement isn't going to be 10 or 20 years. It's going to be 40 or 50 years. Where's the money going to come from? Will your money last as long as you do? And to help fight this problem and to help solve the issue of Americans facing poverty in retirement, uh, the, the fastest growing age group for bankruptcy are those over age 75. I created the Funding Our Future Coalition five years ago. It's now the largest coalition of its kind in the country devoted to retirement security. More than 75 organizations, nonprofit groups, academic organizations, think tanks, uh, government organizations, and major corporations funding the effort to work with Congress to develop policies and laws to improve the ability for ordinary Americans to save, making it easier to save and to save social security, which by the way, uh, the trust fund is going broke and will be depleted in 10 years. So uh, this is the work that I've been doing at, at the Funding Our Future uh, Coalition. You can learn more about our work at fundingourfuture.us. And one of the reasons that I am so focused on crypto is because I recognize that one of the best opportunities for wealth creation to solve the retirement security problem and our related income inequity in America, because we, let's face it, minorities have far less money than white Americans. Women have far less money than men. This wage gap, this wealth gap, uh, is growing at a huge pace and it's crushing our society. And we see it in the violence and the incarceration rates and the school dropout rates and the murder rates. Uh, we've got to solve this problem because we are destroying the lives of tens of millions of US households who are being left out of the financial system. Yep. And so as I try to figure out how can we solve the retirement security crisis? How can we solve the financial inequities that are inherent in our system. How do we turn to investment opportunities that can solve this problem? It's Bitcoin and digital assets, blockchain technology represents the best wealth creation opportunity since the invention of the internet 
back in the 90s. And that's why I formed DACFP, the Digital Assets Council of Financial Professionals. It's an, a crypto education company. We don't sell product. We aren't managing money. Uh, I'm not a competitive threat to anybody in the financial community. Instead, my goal, quite simply, is to teach financial advisors and their firms how to craft a crypto strategy so that you can provide access to this new asset class to your clients in a compliant, safe way that allows you to serve your clients best. And so we do a lot of webinars and seminars, uh, a lot of articles and online content. We have DACFP TV. And our big claim to fame is the certificate in blockchain and digital assets. It's a 13 module, uh, 11 module, 13 CE credits, 11 modules, online self-study, world-class faculty. You take the course at your own pace. Scott Stornetta is on our faculty. He's the co-inventor of blockchain technology. Uh, Shauna Hoffman, who ran IBM's blockchain business, Anders Bronworth of the Boston Fed. It's a world-class faculty teaching you, what is this? What is blockchain? What is Bitcoin? And what about the investment thesis? Hmm. How do you construct a portfolio? What are the investment opportunities? What about regulation, taxation, and compliance? And how do I explain this to my uh, clients? That's what the certificate course offers. It's the most robust uh, program. It's got over 2,200 uh, advisors who have enrolled from around the world in eight countries. And we're really excited that the course gets such rave reviews so that we're teaching advisors how to do this so that they can help their clients, broadening the economic opportunity for everybody in America. I love it. Uh, that's, that's amazing. And to your point, um you know, the future of the economy and, and even the, the ability to build wealth and retire, you know, at, at, a, at a decent living capacity, um, certainly is, crypto is going to be a big part mm -hmm. of that. Um, you know, recently we saw President Biden um, pass a crypto executive order. Uh, we'd love to get your thoughts on that. Do you, uh, most people see that as something good, a call to action for government agencies and a move in the right direction to possibly clear right crypto regulations. Uh, what are your thoughts? You know, Tony, there have been several developments in the past month mm -hmm. that really show how fast this is becoming mainstream and accepted. Uh, the first, as you noted, is the White House executive order on crypto. This is the first such executive order ever. Obama never did it. Trump never did it but Biden now has. Sort of understandable. Obama and Trump could easily ignore crypto. It was new. But now it's such a, such a thing. It's so ever-present uh, with $3 trillion in transactional value, three times the size of American Express. You can't ignore it. And so the president has issued this executive order bringing together the full resources of the federal government to collaborate and develop and foster innovation in the field of crypto, calling on the Federal Reserve to research the adoption of a CBDC, a central bank digital currency. Uh, this is very big news. Bitcoin's price jumped 10% on the announcement. Yep. Uh, simultaneously, you have um, Senator Elizabeth Warren, who a year ago said Bitcoin is turning straw into gold. Now she says it's time for the Fed to develop a CBDC. You have Janet Yellen, the Secretary of the Treasury, who a year ago said that Bitcoin is only good for criminal activity. Yeah. Now, three weeks ago, she says, this is a transformative technology. In Congress, there's the Congressional Blockchain Caucus. 39 members of Congress are members. Uh, so we are now seeing that at every level of government, there is strong support for the development and innovation of this technology. It brings tremendous benefits and value to the federal government and our economy. States and cities are also doing this. The mayors of Miami and New York take their paycheck in Bitcoin. Uh, in Wyoming, uh, Arizona, Oklahoma, Texas, Florida, New York, they are all clamoring uh, to develop laws and regulations that welcome the crypto community because of all the jobs they bring, white collar jobs, green jobs yep. uh, that are excellent for the economy. 
So this is a massive sea change. I couldn't have said this two years ago, but today it is very clear that uh, the government is not banning Bitcoin. They're embracing it. They recognize the tremendous ben benefit and value to Americans and to the economy. And that's all a wonderful thing to say. Yeah, absolutely. And I think uh, what was amazing is after China banned Bitcoin, the miners, you know, they kind of went to different parts of the world. Some came to the United States. And now all of a sudden we see the United States um, is leading uh, in, in some capacity with the hash rate. A lot of Bitcoin mining happening in different states, especially in Texas. Um, and I think the, the largest in North America is, is Riot uh, blockchain, Winstone down in Texas. Uh, what are your thoughts on that? Uh, that just that shift, right? Just last year, it was almost like, oh no, China banned Bitcoin, but now the United States is leading, uh, which is a good thing. Uh, what are your thoughts? Yeah, it's it's the snowballing effect. You know, it's the nature of compound growth. Um, you you plug along day after day after day. You don't seem to have much to show for it. And then, bam, all of a sudden, you see a tremendous sea change. And that's what we've experienced so throughout the 12-year life of crypto. For a long time, the question was, will the government ban it? Hmm. And that question was unresolved for a really long time. You have, you know, the machinations coming out of China, for example, where, you know, they, they didn't just ban Bitcoin last year. They've banned Bitcoin nine times yeah. since its inception. Um, the Chinese government uh, really struggles uh, because the government is communist, but the economy is capitalist. Mm -hmm. And they're really struggling with this new technology. But at the same time, they're the world leader in a CBDC. The Chinese central bank has issued its own digital currency, the digital yuan, and they are very quickly moving it around the world. It's, it's uh, becoming very big in Africa. And this has the United States a little bit concerned, as well as the European Union and the United Kingdom, because we know the, about the authoritarian nature, nature of China and the fact that they are oppressive to uh, humanitarian causes. And this is a big reason why our government is moving so fast in the development of a CBDC to make sure that our dollar continues to be the uh, currency that is used around the world and that we don't lose ground with the Chinese. So it's uh, wonderful to see that we are developing this tech. Uh, it's a little annoying that it has taken this long to get everybody's attention. But over the next couple of years, it's going to get downright exciting. Now, off the branches, off the tree of crypto, if I want to make that analogy, but uh, are NFTs in the metaverse? You know, what are your thoughts on these emerging markets, once again, branches off the crypto market? Well, NFTs are the new big thing uh, and extraordinarily exciting, going to change the face of commerce. Mm -hmm. And the metaverse is the next big thing because a lot of these NFTs will be used in the metaverse. So the metaverse is what's coming next, but NFTs are here now. Uh, the marketplace is astonishing. It began, of course, as most of these things do, with a fad, you know, buying artwork online. Uh, it's really hard to justify $69 million for any piece of art, let alone a digital piece. Uh, and everybody's getting in on the craze, and that's what it is, a craze. We're already beginning to see softening of that craze uh, in the marketplace. Um, but the fact is, the technology underlying it is unbelievably amazing. So don't focus on crypto kitties or uh, a bunch of gorillas, you know, in, in the Board Eight Yacht Club and and all this nonsense. You know, you can shrug your shoulders and wonder if that's a fad or not. And frankly, most of it is. But look at what's happening as a result of the tech, because of the technology of non fungible tokens (NFTs). We can digitize everything. Yeah, we began by digitizing artwork, but now we can digitize your driver's license, your passport, your medical records, the deed to your house. Mm. Everything can be tokenized and placed onto the internet where it is now cyber secure. It is easy to receive, store, and send freely, instantaneously, very low cost with full transparency. Why is it that we still have our driver's licenses in our pocket? How silly is that? 
and our passports where we might lose them or have them get stolen. Why is it that I can't get my medical records easily? Only my insurance company and doctor has them. And it's so hard to get my medical info from one doctor to another doctor. Why isn't all of this on the internet? And that's what's coming. Thanks to NFT technology, which is based on the blockchain and digital assets. So it's yeah. really exciting what's coming. McKinsey says by the end of the decade, 70% of the global GDP will be digital. Mm. Yeah, we are certainly headed to that digital token economy and um, a lot of things will be tokenized on the blockchain and NFTs will be a big part of, of, of verifying digital ownership and, and a lot of our documents. And poly, like you said, like just in all aspects and poly voting, all these things will, will solve a lot of issues, probably a lot, reduce a lot of the hacks, data breaches and so forth because of the technology. And it will simultaneously create amazing new investment opportunities. I'll give you one illustration. We all know that Bob Dylan and Bruce Springsteen, Stevie Nicks, uh, and many others all sold their song rights. Yep. Well, those VC firms that bought the music are going to convert that music into NFTs. You're going to be able to buy Bob Dylan's Blood on the Tracks. You'll own a tiny share of that song. The song's worth um, millions of dollars. And that means every time the song is played on Spotify, you're going to get a royalty check. You're going to be able to own a piece of the action of your favorite athlete or Hollywood star so that as their careers grow, you'll enjoy economic benefit from that. You won't just be a fan, you'll be a business partner. And this is going to be incredibly exciting, creating massive new investment opportunities on an unprecedented scale. It's really wonderful news for wealth creation on a global basis. Most importantly, for people who are currently excluded from the global financial system, there are a billion people in the world who are unbanked. They don't make enough money to have a bank account. All they now need is a, is a cell phone, not even a smartphone, just an ordinary cell phone, and they can participate in all of this to build wealth for themselves in a way they never could before. Yeah, absolutely. A uh, more inclusive economy, economy and um, folks being able to benefit from this technology. Um, Final question here for you. Uh, it's a wrap-up question, and that is, if you could create your own metaverse, what would the theme be about? You know, if, uh, that's a great question, Tony. It, I don't know what I would build it to look like. There are, there are a lot of metaverses being built right now that are really very cool. And I think that the creation of a metaverse is more of a creative activity, artistic creativity, and I lack that. So I'm going to be one of those, one of the many who will be very happy to join and participate in the metaverses that others create. If I could invent my own, I probably would, but I don't know that I've got that skill set. So I'm really looking forward to the further development of these metaverses. Uh, there's a bunch like Decentraland that is already very cool. Uh, and I'm looking forward to, to participating uh, in the metaverses that they do already exist. I know that we'll be adding uh, educational platforms, we're going to probably create something like Edelman University, a safe haven place in the metaverse for people to learn about this stuff. Um, but we'll be participating in the metaverses others build. Very cool. Rick, pleasure chatting with you. Thank you so much for joining me today. It's been my pleasure. Thanks. Thanks.